What is the deal, beautiful people? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Ramon, and around here, we talk about every and everything photography. Today's topic, oh, it's a tough one, vulnerability and how to be vulnerable and why you should be vulnerable. One, two, get down. I'll tell you a little story. So I had a client reach out, uh, an event photography client. And they had a very peculiar ask. And I only say it this way because it was not something I'd ever run across before, or it's not something that a client has ever requested before. And this ask was, as the event was going on, they wanted me to post portraits from the event or have them displayed live on a TV. And I thought this was this was very interesting to say the least because thinking of it from a technical standpoint, uh well standpoint, it could be very difficult and there's a million ways to achieve this. The original concept behind it is the client would provide a backdrop and I would shoot people uh, the attendees of the event at the backdrop as they came in. And uh, I would then hand off the, the SD card to someone that was manning the computer uh, that was then connected to said display or, or TV or whatever. And then I'd go back to shooting. Uh, so the way I kind of architected, it was like, okay, this can be done. You know, I just need to have a few different cards and every 15 to 20 minutes, I would hand off the card to this person and I would put another, you know, another card in and keep shooting. Um, still no easy task because the, the very, the very fact of the matter is I didn't get a chance to edit these images yet. Right. So there's a lot of angst around that. And then does this person know how to copy and paste correctly, right? And I don't mean to sound so nefarious, but, you know, the file names are the file names or whatever file structure is coming from the camera. So you have to pay attention to what was already copied over, what wasn't. You know, there's all these things to it, but I accepted the the opportunity and mush on. Here we are with the story. As I mentioned, the anxiety around this particular opportunity was, well, for me at least, was I am displaying unedited images. And, and as you begin your path into photography, be it creative or, or professional or, or client photography, I should say, there's a distinction there. One of the things you never do is show people your unedited work. And there's there's a myriad of reasons why, right? For me, per se, I prefer to shoot underexposed. And this is because I, I, I opt to protect the highlights in, in whatever I'm doing, street photography, cityscape, portraiture, uh, event photography. Because I shoot this work with, with full frame cameras, I know that the raw metadata is there for me to, you know, up my exposure by two, three stops if I need to. And you can always bring what's in the shadows to light. But once something is exposed, it's very, very difficult or to, well, once something's overexposed, particularly your highlights, it's very difficult to get that detail back because it simply doesn't exist. So I prefer to shoot underexposed and I had a decision to make here. Do I trust, of course I do. Do I trust the camera to shoot properly exposed? And then, you know, in post I'll deal with it, whatever. It's not a big deal, but how are these JPEGs really going to look? And the battle there for me was trusting myself that over the years, I had developed uh, a, a proper understanding of how to build an exposure. Um, so, for instance, 
the venue was decently lit. And at one point, they changed the lighting in the venue, which can add to the anxiety. Uh, but my ISO was anywhere from 1250 to 1600. And again, some people may think that's super high, but it cost me nothing in post to get rid of the, let's call it the noise that's introduced at 1600. Although I'm shooting on a full frame camera, so that noise arguably really isn't that big of a deal. It's not like I'm shooting at 1600 on one of my micro four thirds, right? Totally different conversation. Um, so yeah, the ISO was 1250 to 1600. I was running about 150th of a second to get some nice lighting there. And I was anywhere from, let's call it 5.6. Anywhere from, uh, yeah, 5.6 to F8. Mainly because it was a lot of like group shots. Two to three to four people in these shots. And, you know, I just, I fiddled with the, the, the setting on the speed light to even out the exposure. And much to my surprise... It all looked fine. So they were displaying it on like a 60-inch Samsung TV. And it all looked fine, right? So the, the the lesson here was about 15, 20 minutes in the shoot. I had my first set of images to transfer. I transferred them over. And by the way, the person that was supposed to be handling this, of course, was not. So it was on me again, all right? So I transferred on a laptop displayed it on a TV and I went around the TV and had a look and it looked pretty good. Not only did it look pretty good, uh, but a lot of people at the venue were just like, wow, these images look amazing. And, you know, we can we can get into the conversation of, well, do clients know what amazing images look like? And like, I, whatever, they were happy with what they saw and they were happy with what they saw because it was a vision of the person who was planning the venue that I couldn't see. They thought it would be super cool to be able to see themselves on this TV as the event is unfolding, and I couldn't see it. So I learned something there today. Um, but yes, the, the, the take home for me was trust yourself, trust the settings, you know what you're doing, even if you are or are not going to edit these images, you know what you're doing, fam. JPEGs. JPEGs, JPEGs, JPEGs. So I always shoot raw and JPEG. Um, no particular reason. It's just the way I do it. And in Lightroom, when I when I import my images, uh, it's only set to read the raw files from the card. So that's, you know, neither here nor there. Um because I'm displaying these images live on a TV as the event happens, the raw images are now sort of outside of the conversation. There's these two worlds. The JPEGs are for now on the TV and the raw images are for me when I get home to edit, right? So I've already tackled the underexposure conversation of my settings. These settings are great for both now and later in post. Now I'm looking at the JPEGs. And uh, there's some tricks. There's some tricks on the camera that I, I have to now come back and acknowledge was useful. For instance, the skin smoothening. <laughs> so I always looked at this setting and I remember seeing this setting way back on my Sony NEX5. I was like, this stuff is cool. But then when you start to do your snob photography thing, I don't shoot JPEGs. I only shoot RAW. None of these settings really apply to you uh, because these settings are only applicable to the JPEGs. Uh, so things like skin smoothening, things like the DRO, uh, what is DRO? Dynamic range optimization, right? So I turned on the skin smoothening to high because this was an older crowd. So let's give them a youthful feeling as best I can. Um, I turned on the DRO to 100 or was it, it was auto, it was on auto, right? So what that did was th these two very things really aided to the JPEGs looking as amazing as they did. Uh, the skin smoothening really added, let's call it a touch of post-processing to the JPEGs and the dynamic range optimization, it really drew together 
a lot of the lighting in the venue, right? So if you could imagine in a venue, you've got ceiling lighting, you've got lighting from all types of, of, of lights that are hanging off the ceiling and chandeliers, like it, it all looked really nice together. And this was the first time in years that I came back and said to myself, wow, these JPEG settings really do have a place. Right. And and now going forward, I'll never look at any of these these different settings and modes and creative options. And that was a that was a that was another one. Right. Like I put the creative setting of the camera, the portrait, because it accentuated the tones of skin and blah, blah, blah. Like these things have a place. And, and you know, my bad, my bad for taking it for granted. You know, you take stuff for granted until you need it. And I needed it. And they were there. Good job, Sony. Just like good job, Canon and Olympus, because they all got these, these comparable settings. So I was happy that that was there. Moment selection. You like the way I said that? <laughs> Shot selection. So one of the things I now had to do is I had to be very purposeful with the shots that I took. And the reason being is I'm sort of culling these images live. And what that means is the more images I take, which is something I often do, I'll take two or three different versions of a particular moment, just in case somebody blinks, the camera missed focus, the flash didn't go off. I've got one of three images to choose from to make sure that I deliver that moment. Here, me capturing one moment three times means when I go to copy these files over on the computer, I got to look past three of the same goddamn moment. And I didn't want to deal with that. And what that did, that forced me to not only shoot each instance, each portrait, each moment once, but it forced me to slow the hell down. So what, what my, my, my workflow when I was at this particular event was, all right, everyone crowd around, whoever's in the shot, you get in the shot. I would look to make sure the clothing was good, make sure name tags were facing the camera, make sure there was nobody in the background. So all the little things that I normally would not take care of, I took care to do. And I, I can honestly say at the end of the day, you know, one, copying them over live to the, the laptop that was displaying to the TV made my life a lot easier because I wasn't, I wasn't looking for duplicates of a moment to omit. I was just control A, control C, control V, and I'm out of there, right? But when I came home to edit those images in post, I didn't have a whole lot of culling to do. So this was a lesson for me, uh, you know, and I'll, I'm still sort of deciding how I'll move going forward. You know, for sure I'll take my time, but maybe I don't need to capture three or four of the same moment, maybe just one or two, or maybe just one. Um, and there was there was something that, you know, I, I would say as a result of the circumstances, I found myself chimping. Is it chimping, chipping? I don't know. Different people say it different, but I'll call it chimping. And we all know what that is. That's when you see a photographer somewhere, take a picture, and you're immediately looking on the back of the camera, zooming in. For the first hour of the event, I had to do this, right? Because it was it was me like still being anxious about the reality of these images are being posted live. So I need to make sure that everything is sharp and looks good. The reality of the event, meaning um, I can't capture two or three or multiple of the moment. I got this one time. So I got to make sure that I nail focus. So I found myself doing that for the first hour or so of the event. Uh, until I gained the confidence, like, no, nah, I'm good. I got it. Everything's dialed in. You're fine. You're hitting your groove. You're hitting your stride. Just let it happen. Um, but yeah, even even that, I have a new perspective on chimping, right? Like there is a time and place to just double check your work. You know, I, I, got, I got the clients. I got three people still standing in front of me. Hang on, guys. Give me literally three seconds while I hit this play button. While I hit this zoom in button and on the back of my camera, I look to see, ah, I nail focus. That's it, guys. We got it. Thank you. And it happened twice where I didn't get it. Let's try that one more time. 
15 seconds, I was out of there. And and really what that meant in the long scheme of things, I think there was only out of 170 images that I delivered, there were only two that were out of focus and not by a lot. Uh, I was able to fix them with, with Topaz, Image Sharper or whatever. Uh, I was happy with that. I was happy with that. Before I proceed, some housekeeping. If you are enjoying the video thus far, I would love for you to hit that like button and uh, click on the channel. Check out the various other videos I've done in the past. If you like what you see, hit subscribe. I'd love to have you around. But here's a question for you that you can feel free to answer in the comment section down below. I often enjoy the conversations down there. I learn a lot from you guys as well. Um, do you recall a, a time in your photography, be it professional or creative, when you were vulnerable, right? And, and I get it. We as people don't like to be vulnerable. It's not a good feeling. It's, it's this feeling of not being enough, not known enough, not, you know, not pushing enough and this insecurity and, and, and what do people think of me and like all of this stuff. And it's, it's not a good feeling, but I, I think vulnerability is a, is a great catalyst for propelling you to the next level. And, you know, this particular video and this particular event that I'm talking about was me being vulnerable for the first time in a very long time in my work. Um, and, and this is why I'm sitting here today sharing this experience with you, uh, because there's a lot that I learned from it. And, and I always had a mantra that every so often I forget. And, and it's, you know, we need to be comfortable being uncomfortable because when when you're comfortable, needles don't move. Things don't progress. When you're uncomfortable, shit happens, right? So I'm always thankful for this vulnerability when it when it shows up. Um, and it lets me know that I'm, I'm still trending in the direction of progress. And I'm happy for that. But I, I would love to hear from you guys. Um, you know, is there is there a time when, when pertaining to your camera and a subject or, or client or whomever that you had some vulnerability and how, how did you receive that? How did you perceive that? how did you get around it? How did you propel yourself from it? How did you, did you take notes? What did you learn from it? Let me know, hit the comment section down below. As the event was going on, I started to learn something about myself, something I'd questioned a few times because I, I, I believe I believe my natural progression is to really investigate or get into wedding photography at some point. And, you know, the copious amounts of research that I've done, wedding photography is really this mismatch of all these disciplines of photography. You know, you do landscape stuff, you do portrait stuff, you do detail, like almost to the product photography stuff. You know, you you're you got to be an exceptional business person. You you gotta. It's all these things, right? And the number one thing that that always stood out to me about wedding photography, I felt like I've had all of these skills and these disciplines, but there was one that I always questioned, and it was the composure. You know, the day of uh, of weddings, it's it's not, it's no longer your skill that is the question here. It's your composure. Can you be composed when dealing with difficult problems and challenges? Well, the the florists say, "Go fuck yourself." You can't have her hold this 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 bouquet. It's not for that. It's for the tables. How do you get that shot that you envision? Right. Uh, the venue says they can't be on that balcony. Their balcony is the one downstairs. You get your shit and get the fuck up out of there. Well, how do you make do with what you have, right? Oh, I've got this beautiful idea for this amazing 200-year-old tree that's out the back in the venue, but it's raining. What do you do now? So it's, it's, it's this, do I have what it takes to maintain my composure and allow, allow myself to sort of begin to troubleshoot and solve these problems as it happens? 
this one event really helped me see that I had what it takes, right? Because number one, there was supposed to be a backdrop and there wasn't. So that kind of changed things. So now I go from this comfort zone where when I accepted the job, oh, okay, I'm just taking portraits of people by a backdrop. Very controlled lighting and setting, copying and pasting and throwing it on the fine to like, nope, that doesn't exist. Now you need to walk around a venue where the lighting and the situations are very varied. Oof. Okay. Then I went from, uh, for whatever reason, my speed light was not forming a proper connection with the hot shoe and it would work sometimes and it wouldn't work. So it took me about 30 minutes of fiddling to, to realize I got to hold it a certain way to apply certain pressure. And that pressure means I look like an idiot every shot I take and I'm holding it. That was another thing. I've already explained the, the copying, the unedited images over to the TV. So there's, you know, there, there was all these things that like, whew, how am I going to deal with this? How am I going to deal with this? But... I, I, I think the approach was one at a time. You just deal with it as it happens, fam. It's okay. You'll figure it out. And I figured it out. And then as the event started to, you know, it kept rolling and kept rolling. And, and then people would just, I, you know, it, it was really a very, like, fulfilling moment for me. Because as the event was going on, I started to notice that people's attention was on that TV. And they were enjoying the images that they saw. So it wasn't about... Hmm, he should have been using 5.6, but he's using, you know, or he's using F8, or hmm, I see a tiny bit of noise in these images. Like, none of that shit happened. People were just enjoying the moments that I was able to put on that TV that happened literally minutes ago. And it helped them be present in their event even more. And, you know, it, it, it really helped me reflect to a, a point where, like, wow, my drive home, like, I can, I can deal with chaos. I can deal with variations. I can deal with roadblocks and, and stipulations and problems and problem solving. And, and I'm okay now. You know what I mean? Like, maybe next year I'll start looking into, to, to dipping my toe into the wedding photography world and, Becoming a second shooter because I think I got I, I got what it takes right so that that was that was another really great realization from this event. You know, this one's a little a little funny. Um, the clients were thrilled with the work, um, and they tipped me very generously. And I'm always happy. I, I do receive a, a fair bit of tips, right? Because I try to be very personable. And, you know, I try not to just stay in my lane. Like, if I see the DJ struggling to bring in some speakers, I'll help out. You know what I mean? Like, little things like that, I, I feel goes a long way. Um, but I, I, I often, I'd say about 50% of my jobs, I receive really good tips. And driving home, you know, enjoying the uh the fun juice of the event like oh man that turned out quite well i learned a lot about myself i made it i was like wow with another generous tip wait a minute <laughs> wait a minute if they're able to tip me so generously there's an argument here that i'm not charging enough <laughs> right so you know i i got home and i I looked at my pricing and I, I came up with a new way to form my pricing and and really a breakdown of what I should be charging for and what that pricing looks like. And yeah, I up my prices and, and I'm not up in my prices to gouge my clients. It's like, no, I'm I'm starting to realize what I'm worth, how much I'm worth. Right. So, uh, yeah, I came home and, and raised my prices and and, and not only that, but I put some structure behind it so that when a client asks, OK, well, why is your price in the way it is? I can just send that over to them. Right? I don't want them to feel like I'm just taking a shot in the dark. Well, here's what I feel like charging today. Like, no. Um, but yeah, this this event, I mean, when it when it's all said and done, 
this event I think was one of one of a milestone type, right? And I feel like whatever it is you do with your camera, you reach these milestones. And you could shoot in concept the exact same thing week after week, but there's always gonna be one. Some week, something is just going to challenge you differently, make you feel differently, and it's going to catapult you into thinking differently or thinking in a new direction. And this event was that for me, right? And 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 I really had to scale back and go, wow, you know, leading up to the event because the, the client had reached out like almost a month before and I had a long time to think about it and I was just like... All right, I know I can do this. I know I can do this, but I can't exactly do this with confidence. How am I going to pull this off? And and it it was, you know, the days leading up to the event, thinking about it and getting the anxiety, getting at the event. I arrived early, half an hour early because I needed to figure things out. I needed to see where things were going to be. And in that half an hour, I discovered there's no backdrop, but I saw the TV. I discovered that my speed light was playing the ass, so I was able to figure out how to maneuver that like all these things and 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 I was I was very vulnerable. You know, I, I wasn't the same confident self that I'd been on the jobs before this. And um, you know, even in the vulnerability, there there's progress, there's things to learn. Um, you know, be it be it the ideology of how I approach problem solving or knowing that I can problem solve on a higher level, on a valuable level for my clients, but but even like your pricing, learning the value of myself, you know, had it not been for this last tip, which was very generous again, wait a minute. So how much money did they have in the budget? How much money were they willing to spend? I'm worth that. And I'm not worth that because I say I am. I'm worth that because the client's willing to pay that, right? So yeah, you know, I wanted to share that experience with you guys. And 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 again, as always, hit the comments down below, man. I, I love the conversations that we have here. They're very inspirational for me. Um, and, and in terms of creating content, you know, the, the things you guys share with me, and not only in the comments down below, but you guys reach out to me on Instagram, on Facebook. Like, I, I love it. I, I love hearing from you guys and, and really building forward and, and, and pushing the narrative forward. So, yeah, like the video if you like it. Contribute to the conversations if you so feel inclined. My name is Ramon. I'm out of here. Peace.